Hello and welcome to the program. I am Amarachi Ubani. Diplomatic Channel comes to you from the U.S. capital, Washington, D.C., where a small but very effective meeting has been holding all week. It's a constituency for Africa, Ronald H. Brown series, and Channel Television is a partner this year. Established in 1990, the CFA hopes to build relations between African, African-American, and American communities in trade, relations, and diplomatic ties. And Channel Television is a partner. Here's more about the CFA. It's a very unique group, the Constituency for Africa. Founded in 1990, CFA is made up of concerned Africanists, interested citizens, and Africa-focused organizations, with a strategy to building organized support for Africa in the United States. The CFA has observed that very little is known about Africa, even in the schools, Africa is reported through the eyes of explorers and missionaries who made their way to the continent. The group's president and CEO, Melvin Foote, believes the CFA can help change this primitive understanding. Everything involved around unity. You know, I kind of grew up uh, reading the books of Marcus Garvey and Kwame Nkrumah and C.L.R. James and Pat Moore and some of those old guys. And I've always believed that this unity is the key to our success. Um, what I see in Washington is that everybody goes at it alone, you know. Uh, what my brother says over here, I mean, he's, he's speaking truth. He's speaking truth. And CFA is also a testament to that truth. Now, if we can't get a piece of that action, something's wrong with us. And you can multiply that times USAID. You can, uh, so, as, as a community, you know, we have tremendous access with the Congressional Black Caucus and with members of the Congress. They listen to us. I put Karen Bass and Brain Trust together every year. But we have got to come in as a community and leverage and lobby what we want from this. Using the strategy of town hall meetings, the CFA discusses topics such as business, trade and investment, human rights, culture, governance, media, democracy, and the HIV AIDS pandemic. The group has held town hall meetings in more than 30 cities in the United States and attracted nearly 15,000 participants. And every year, the CFA holds the Ronald H. Brown series usually held in conjunction with the U.S. Congressional Black Caucus Legislative Week in September. The series is held in honor of the late U.S. Commerce Secretary for his exemplary accomplishments in building strategic, political, economic, and cultural linkages between the United States and Africa. We're talking about an MOU with my brother here, CFA. I think it would be a great thing to do, you know. CFA needs to be empowered, you know. We have the access. We wrote a lot of President Obama's Africa strategy President George Bush pet fire that came from us. $15 billion for, for HIV aid. It came from CFA. That's where the roots are, you know. But my point is, all kinds of entrepreneurship opportunities galore out there. But we don't have access to our own community. We're not getting support from our own community to do the things that we need to do to support you. So one of the things I'm hoping that we can come out of this with is a strategy for helping to unify our, our global African community. There are more than a thousand concerned individuals and organizational representatives attending the series each year to gain valuable information and build strategic linkages to tackle African and American challenges, issues and concerns. The group is credited with fostering grassroots mobilization that resulted in the passage of two most historical pieces of American legislation concerning Africa. They're the African Growth and Opportunity Act, AGOA, and the Global AIDS Trust Fund. This year's Ronald H. Brown African Affairs Series is being co-chaired by Channels Television and four other organizations. That you've had to put together this week. The group so reached out to Africa's best television stations to help America understand the impact of Western reporting of Africa's issues. There are some good news stories in the United States. The reporting on Africa is mar markedly different than it was 25 years ago. I mean, you see in The Economist and Newsweek and Time Magazine and New York Times and Washington Post, some at least the acknowledgement that six out of the 10 fastest growing economies are on the continent of Africa. And acknowledging this prowess in addition to a lot of other things and um, Africa's increasingly important role to the international community. During a media roundtable attended by a cross-section of African-American media, 
guest panelist, who was the chairman, CEO of Channel Television, Mr. John Momo, casts more light on how badly Africa is affected by the negative image. It was uh, very important for the Western media, the, the, the Reuters, the APs, who have now assumed the position of doling out global news and making sure that people take from them and, and, and send the same message across to everyone that this is a continent which has been ravaged again by a disease. Africa has been seen, in quotes, as a dark continent. And so there's no journalist who will come from this part of the world who is trying to report a story that will not take, use that as a backdrop. So it's no surprising. Uh, it's, it's not a surprise for, for us to, to note that the Ebola was, was an ammunition for them to report the way they've always reported. His co-panelist, founder, Discovery Learning Alliance, Eric Naboa, agrees with him that there has been a lopsided approach to reporting on Africa's issues, but suggests that news media in Africa change the economics to balance their stories. My perspective is that it, it's really about, largely about economics. Well, two things, economics being one of them. And, and so I think what Mr. Momo said is, is really right, that those economic interests are ever-present. Um, whether, whether it's a broadcast or, or newspaper, um, you know, everything outside of, of blogs, typically they're pretty significant news organizations. They're businesses, and they need to make money. And so they um, will do what they need to do. If, if it bleeds, it leads would be one of those sort of key elements to driving uh, revenue for, for those businesses. So I think what they have to do when they look at it from a purely business lens is they have to find stories that are urgent and they have to find stories that are relevant. Or they create urgency and relevance in the stories that they have one, one way or another. And so one of the things that I think, you know, as consumers have to do is, is, is sort of you know, vote with their legs, vote with their pocketbooks, and decide what media they're going to consume and how they're going to consume it, because that, over the long term, is going to change and challenge um, what, what news outlets are, are putting out. Participants are eager to begin the journey to better inform the free world about Africa, but transforming a long-existing mindset has never been easy. You don't have any basis for communication about Africa, or with Africans for that matter. Because the only thing you know is somebody's got a bone in their nose and is being herded onto a ship. You don't get to hear the word Africa in a positive fashion till you get to college. And then if you choose to study it. If you choose to study it. So you're talking about African Americans who, who will call Africa a big country just like every other American does. It's a big country. Man, it's you cannot be talking about terrorism in Nigeria, for example, and then you are somewhere around Lagos and then reporting for CNN. Okay. That will not hold water. So if we are going to begin to report Africa the way it is, then our perspective of reporting must change, especially for the foreign media. We then have to begin to go the extra mile, which is ensuring that we are there when it's happening. Yeah, I, I love what Mr. Momo acknowledges the fears and concerns around, and sharing a bit of the channel's story strongly advises that the private the sector video. take the lead um, by establishing an independent news agency credited with providing reliable information about reforms, policies and achievements on the continent. As a journalist, when there's a story about Ebola ravaging some remote areas in one or two Afri West African uh, states, it makes news. But that's not all the news. When journalists come into Nigeria and they want to work with us, they have a framework. They have a structure. Um, now we know that Africans don't live on trees anymore, but the structure <laughs> is there. They live on, look for images of uh, general view shots of people living on trees, or look, go to some slums and bring us pictures of our slums, and then you can you can use that as a backdrop to report your story. 
um, that shouldn't happen. I, 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 I think the, 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 we, have, we have to change narrative, and we are the ones, the ones who can change narratives ourselves. There is so much to discuss and so little time to do so. However, a media task force is formed with participants as members and the two panelists as advisors. You know, four links and the theme for the 2014 Ronald H. Brown African Affairs Series is promoting the STEM revolution in Africa, a diaspora priority. The launch of the Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics Initiative offers the African diaspora an opportunity to play a significant role in the STEM revolution in Africa. Dr. Kem Kumba, a lecturer at the University of Michigan and a member of the CFA, explains why it is important the diaspora becomes a part of the initiative. 